No, I always forget to log in my iPhone first to check to make sure I'm live. Perfect. I am live. All right. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another weekly live stream where we talk about news and we learn together. <laughs> um, and uh, if you guys are not familiar with this format, we cover three main things. The first thing is pharmacy news the second thing is like informatics slash public health slash pub informatics type news and then the, the third thing which i'm actually going to start doing is just briefly scan through um new articles that are coming out for the month or have come out for that month you know there's never a a, a reason to not check out what's going on in the literature and i used to look at those all the time so uh we're gonna go ahead and get started for that um, if you haven't already, make sure you give the video a like because right, that helps out uh, the YouTube algorithm. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start off with the daily briefing from ASHP, which uh, we're going to start off with today's. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everyone. Uh, let's see what is going on today. So move over here. All right, leading the news for ASHP today, President Biden says he wants at least 70% of adults to receive at least one dose of corona coronavirus vaccine by 4th of July. So the Washington Post says he wants at least 60% of adults to be fully vaccinated against coronavirus by the 4th of July. It's like about two months from now. And for 70% to have received at least one dose. To help more people get vaccinated, President Biden also announced a shift in strategy to focus more sharply on hesitant and rural Americans, directing pharmacies to offer walk-in appointments, allocating funding for pop-up clinics, and sending more doses to rural health clinics, among other moves. To meet Biden's new goals, the U.S. will need to dispense 100 million shots over the next 60 days, beyond the more than 2 million that have been administered so far. I can't really uh, i guess i'm like i can't really tell if this is more ambitious than before the impression that i get is that there's an over surplus of supply and not a lot of demand right now so uh, that's just my impression going to keep at it most people will be convinced by the fact that their failure to get the vaccine may cause other people to get sick and maybe die uh 50 of adults in the u.s have received at least one dose so far but that's kind of reassuring i think that's actually higher than i expected 56% of adults in the U.S. have received at least one dose so far. The Biden administration also states on Tuesday that it will redistribute vaccine doses allocated to states if a state isn't able to use all of its share in a given week. Yeah, so this here makes me think, again, there's a oversurplus of supply uh, right now, less demand. And states that want more can apply for any unclaimed amounts each week. It probably d depends on state, of course. Um, so that's important to know, you know, keep on track with what's going on in the, uh, the states. So at least 70% of adults to receive at least one dose. So we are at 56%, uh, I guess, as of yesterday, May 4th. All right. Uh, looks like other COVID news. Pfizer expects to apply for emergency authorization from FDA for use of COVID-19 vaccine in children between the ages of, wow, two and 11. That's a pretty big expansion. So the U New York Times reports that Pfizer expects to apply to the Food and Drug Administration in September for emergency authorization to administer its coronavirus vaccine to children between the ages of two and 11. It says it also plans to apply this month for full approval of the vaccine for use in people from ages 16 to 85. CNN also reports that Pfizer CEO Albert said in an earnings meeting on Tuesday, the company submitted new data to the FDA on Friday, and it may soon have an emergency use authorization to allow standard refrigeration for up to four weeks. Currently, its vaccine is authorized to be stored at ultra cold temperatures between negative 80 and negative 60 degrees Celsius, or in cold storage between negative 25 and negative 15 degrees Celsius for a maximum of two weeks, which can complicate distribution of the vaccine. CNN says the new data could allow the vaccine to be stored at standard temperatures between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius for up to four weeks. That's pretty game-changing. 
um, and good news to hear because distribution has certainly made it more difficult. Uh, it will be very interesting to see how this pans out. I imagine that it will be um, approved in children ages 2 to 11, but that that's pretty big news to me. Okay, uh, BioNTech seeks approval for COVID-19 vaccine formulation that can be stored longer at higher temperatures than first version. Hmm. Seeking approval, uh, we stored up to six months at two to eight degrees Celsius. Our first formulation had to be stored and shipped at minus 80 degrees. We have now in the meantime a formulation which is not yet approved, which can be stored at two to eight degrees. I wonder what the breakthrough was um, in the change in temperature. I'm not interested enough to look into it, <laughs> but it seems as though some breakthrough must have occurred where they're able to store things at a lower degree or warmer temperatures. Researchers say SARS-CoV-2 reinfection is uncommon and generally milder than primary infection, but has been associated with two deaths. Reports researchers found SARS-CoV-2 reinfection was uncommon and milder than primary infection, but was associated with two deaths. Findings were published in Clinical Infectious Disease. Uh, one of my favorite journals, Clinical Infectious Disease, if you guys are not a fan or don't are not aware, is like one of I would say is the top um, by impact factor. Usually it is the top infectious disease journal. So this is a pretty reputable article. Reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 in patients undergoing serial laboratory testing. Let's just do what they teach us not to do in school and just scan the abstract and look at the conclusion. We identified a low rate of reinfection confirmed by laboratory tests in a large cohort of patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection Although reinfection appeared to be milder than primary infection, there was associated mortality. I don't think that's a surprise, isn't it? Like, if, if anyone gets infected with any type of disease, you would expect that some mortality may occur. I don't think that's a surprise. Maybe it's just the fact that people are assuming that getting the vaccine may necessarily be complete immune to everything else, which of course is not the case, but will prevent a vast majority of deaths and severe illness. Okay, uh, what's next? Researchers examined face mask compliance and vaccination rates among healthcare workers at two hospitals. This looks interesting. So reports two studies published in Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology examining US healthcare workers' attitudes toward the present pandemic indicate face mask wearing is spotty and vaccination rates are more variable by demographics and attitudes than access. In one study, researchers visually tracked face mask protocol compliance at a 450-bed hospital in Connecticut and recorded a median weekly compliance rate of 82%. In the other study, researchers found 71% of the staff at Virginia Hospital Center had received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine by March 10th, and there were significant differences in vaccination rates among different demographic groups. I, I, if I had more time, I'll probably look more into this. It's just interesting to know the trends of, well, for this study, uh, who within the healthcare setting is opting for the vaccine and who's not. And then in this one is, you know, what, what is the, the cause for wearing face masks or not? Wouldn't everyone be expected to be like near 100% compliance with face masks if you work in a hospital? I think that's interesting, but not interesting enough for me to look into it. If you guys are there, you should definitely check it out. Um, okay, maybe we're, we're gonna breeze through these a little bit more. Bill Velrudin appears to be effective in treating a post COVID-19 vaccination. Okay, this is interesting. Appears to be effective in treating a post COVID-19 vaccination blood clot case. Worked for one of the very rare cases of blood clots with low platelets after vaccination against COVID-19 after receiving the treatment, the 40-year-old patient's platelet count steadily rose from uh, 20 at admission to 115 at discharge after six days in the hospital and then 182 on outpatient follow-up on day nine. Her headache resolved without clinical sequelae of thrombosis or evidence of bleeding. Well, that's good. I haven't been following up with people who received blood clots uh, after a COVID-19 vaccination, but... So I'm not sure what the significance of this, but it is great to hear that there is 
some treatment that have been found to be effective. Um, Curvax says it cannot predict short-term supply of COVID-19 vaccine due to U.S. export restrictions. That, I don't know. That, that's not interesting to me. European Medicines Agency starts rolling review of Sinovac's coronavirus vaccine. I don't remember if this is the one we talked about last week. So European Medicines Agency has started a rolling review of China's Sinovac coronavirus vaccine to assess its effectiveness and safety. It said its decision to start the review is based on preliminary results from laboratory studies and clinical studies. The EMA is also conducting rolling reviews of three other vaccines, the one developed by German biotech company CureVac and the American-developed Novavax and Russia's Sputnik V. I think last week we talked about Novavax. So this one's new. So China's vaccine is apparently the Sinovac. And then German is CureVac and Russian is Sputnik. Okay. All right, moving on to non-COVID news. Expanding, uh, expand, Biden expands ban on fentanyl-like substances. Washington state enacts law aimed at increasing hospital transparency. Uh, actually, this is kind of interesting. So this one says, Washington state hospitals must now report additional financial and patient demographic information to state under a new law intended to increase transparency. Signed a bill into law on Monday that requires state hospitals to provide information, including reports about charity care and emergency aid to the State Department of Health. The law will be implemented in stages over the next two years. Um... Maybe not interesting enough to read into, but like I always say in these weekly live streams, um, it, financial incentives are very interesting because that's where new work comes in and that's important to pay attention to. Health coverage and access. Researchers say one third of neighborhoods in, US, in large US cities are pharmacy deserts. Hmm. One third of neighborhoods in the 30 largest U.S. cities are pharmacy deserts, and this is much more common in black and Hispanic communities. In the study, neighborhoods were, where most residents have cars were labeled a pharmacy desert if the average distance to the nearest pharmacy was one mile or more. That's, that's come on, I don't know, that's, that's a little extreme, isn't it? Nearest pharmacy is one mile or more. The findings were published in Health Affairs, Dallas was among the cities with the worst gaps in pharmacy access. I mean, Dallas and, and Texas in general is just large. Do you really expect a pharmacy like every mile? That just seems a little inefficient, but eh, I don't know. It seems like a clickbait title, if anything. But of course, I know a lot of us do want access to uh, pharmacies closer, but being labeled a desert when it's, only, when it's uh, farther than one mile? It would have been nice to see like a range uh, or the other, uh, how far they actually were. All right, let's see, research. Okay, nothing else interesting. We're going to move on. We actually spent 13 minutes on that. So, okay, so that's the pharmacy news. Let's check out uh, AMIA. AMIA's daily download news for informatics, public health, Population health policy kind of news. So let's see what we have today. Okay. Um, can I pop this out? Let me see if I can pop this out. Here it is. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Where did it go? Here it is. Um, all right, let's start the interesting news. So it's, they must be like very similar writers. The top news on both sides is Biden gets, aims to get 70% of adults uh, at least one COVID-19 vaccine by July 4th. Okay. Primary care physician for every American, science panel urges. The federal government must aggressively bolster primary care and connect more Americans with a dedicated source of care. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine warn in a major report that sounds the alarm about an endangered foundation of the US health system. This sounds very like grim. Let me just take a look at this a little bit more. The, the thing is, I'm kind of curious like what they're actually saying, because I feel like they say this all the time, right? There's always a shortage of primary care physicians, which is important, but like, is, is this anything new? 
It's always been an issue. The urgently worded report, which comes as internists, family doctors, and pediatricians nationwide struggle with the economic fallout of the coronavirus. coronavirus pandemic calls for a broad recognition that primary care is a common good akin to public education. Is there anything else? An advisory, but does not guarantee federal action. Uh, new generation of medical systems that rely on primary care to look after elderly Americans on Medicare. I don't know. There's, there's nothing interesting. Like, I think it's not news or not novel or anything new that, one, there's a shortage of primary care physicians. I think many of us know that they're less paid or well compensated as opposed to specialists. So if you're, you know, someone going through medical school, wouldn't you be more incentivized to pursue a specialist route? I know they always do like different, again, payment incentives drives some of this. And I know uh, payment reform in the past has tried to level out the playing field a little bit in terms of getting more primary care physicians um, into that space versus becoming a specialist. Uh, not that interesting though, not new. Cooperative AI, machines must learn to find common ground. To help humanity solve fundamental problems of cooperation, scientists need to re reconceive artificial intelligence as deeply social. I don't even know what they're talking about, but it sounds interesting. It's a commentary. Uh, what is? What are they trying to say? Artificial intelligence assistance and recommendation algorithms interact with billions of people every day influencing lives in a myriad of ways yet they still have little understanding of humans self-driving vehicles controlled by artificial intelligence are gaining mastery of their interactions with the natural world but they are still novices when it comes to coordinating with other cars pedestrians or collaborating with their human operators hmm what's the point they're trying to make AI cooperation. Uh, let me read this one pair. AI research on cooperation will need to bring together many clusters of work. A first cluster consists of AI cooperation tackling ever more difficult, rich, and realistic settings. A second is AI human cooperation for which we need to advance natural language understanding enables machines to learn about people's preferences and make machine reasoning more accessible to humans. A third cluster is work on tools for improving and not harming human, human cooperation, such as ways of making the algorithms that govern social media better at promoting healthy online communities. So I'm not gonna to read too much more into this, but I think this is a very, one of those articles that I would love to dive deeper into because like AI and how we use it, its application, how we govern it, is fascinating to me we're kind of like creating the space for it right now so um yeah i think it's super fascinating to uh think about how we will design these systems in the future how we govern them how we regulate them and just food for thought so this i think these kind of things broaden your your mindset and how we can use it anyways what else do we got Births in U.S. dropped to levels not seen since 1979. Now, that is a clickbait title that I will click on. Births in U.S. dropped to levels not seen since 1979. Millennials fuel continued downward trend in fertility rates. Oh, it's a paywall. Oh, no, never mind. The number of babies born in America last year was the lowest in more than four decades, according to federal figures released Wednesday that show a continuing U.S. fertility slump. U.S. women had about 3.61 million babies in 2020, down 4% from the prior year. Uh, the total fertility rate, a snapshot of the average number of babies a woman would have over her lifetime, fell to 1.64 the lowest rate on record since the government began tra tracking it in the 1930s and likely before that when families were larger. Total births were the lowest since 1979. These, these kind of like demographic changes are very interesting. Again, if I had more time, I'd probably read into it. It's just interesting to know these kind of things. But I think the headline is fine for now. 
Births in the U.S. dropped to levels not seen since 1979. Okay. Clinical informatics news. Let's see. A doctor trained nurse practitioners to do colon... colon, colon I can't pronounce it. I don't know what's going on today. Uh, uh, colonoscopies. There it is. I was struggling with that for a second. Crit critics say his research exploited black patients. Hmm. That's not good. At a time when medical researchers are under pressure to increase diversity in clinical trials, a Johns Hopkins study is sparking outrage among some physicians because of its large number of black patients. I'm a little confused by that. What's going on? A doctor trained nurse practitioners to do colonoscopies. Critics say his research ex oh, so it's exploited black patients. Uh... Let's see. It was a retrospective study analyzing the abilities of three specifically trained nurse practitioners to perform colonoscopies, an invasive and potentially life saving cancer screening procedure normally done by gastroenterologists. Of the more than 1,000 patients who received screening colonoscopies from the nurse practitioners from 2010 to 2016, nearly 75% were black. Oh, that's kind of interesting. This is like like a ethical, uh, potential ethical issue. Um, I mean, there's I don't feel like there's enough time to dive into this, but there's a lot that can be said about this. Um, but we can move on. How COVID nineteen affects telehealth remote patient monitoring landscape. The coronavirus pandemic has dramatic dramatically altered the tele telehealth landscape pushing providers to adopt or expand connected health platforms and tools to meet the demand for virtual care to replace in-person services. Uh, that's not too interesting. Healthcare organizations ask HHS to delay quality measures a reporting for ACOs. The American Hospital Association and American Medical Association are among the 11 organizations signing the letter. Okay, they need more time. Nothing too interesting. Next is bioinformatics and data science. Pfizer reaps hundreds of millions in profits from COVID vaccine. The company said its vaccine generated $3.5 in revenue in the first three months of the year. Wow. Maybe not surprising uh, that a pharma company would be making a lot of money. I, I just thought it, they wouldn't have profited that much. This is probably going to feel some more like conspiracy theories. Anything specific? Like what are what is their typical revenue? I don't have a comparator to look into. Pfizer made a big decision unlike several rival manufacturers. Yeah, this is very. So let me read this. Last year, racing to develop a vaccine in record time, Pfizer made a big decision. Unlike several rival manufacturers, which vowed to forego profits on their shots during the COVID-19 pandemic, Pfizer planned to profit on its vaccine. Okay, this is very interesting. On Tuesday, the company announced just how much money the shots it is generating. The vaccine brought in $3.5 billion in revenue in the first three months of the year, nearly a quarter of its total revenue. The vaccine was far, was far and away Pfizer's biggest source of revenue. The company did not disclose the profits it derived from the vaccine, but it reiterated its previous prediction that its profit margins on the vaccine would be in the high 20% range. That would translate into roughly $900 million in pre-tax vaccine profits in the first quarter. Pfizer has been widely credited with developing an unproven technology that has saved an untold number of lives. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, How do you really measure this? Revenue versus saving lives through novel technology. Um, and how does it compare to the rival manufacturers and do they get any credit? I don't know, it's a lot to think about, but we can leave and move on to the next one. A real world look at COVID-19 vaccines versus new variants. Clinical trials have shown that COVID-19 vaccines now being administered around the country are highly effective in protecting fully vaccinated individuals from the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 but will they continue to offer sufficient protection as the frequency of more transmissible, in some cases, deadly emerging, 
emerging variants rise? This is something I would like to know. Like, variants are inevitably gonna keep coming, right? So how are we going to tackle this problem with the vaccines? Is there anything like one paragraph I can read? Uh, yeah, of course, more study and time is needed to fully answer the question. The new data from Israel offers a early look at how the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is holding up in the real world against coronavirus variants of concern, including the UK variant and the South African variant. And while there is some evidence of breakthrough infections, the findings overall are encouraging. All right, that's good to know. Anything else? Let me see, I saw something that might have been interesting here. Many questions remain, including whether the vaccines reduce the duration and or severity of infections, Nevertheless, the findings are a reminder that while these va vaccines offer remarkable protection, they are not foolproof. Breakthrough infections can and do occur. Uh, these findings in Israel and the United States also highlight the importance of tracking coronavirus variants and making sure that all eligible individuals get vaccinated as soon as they have the opportunity. They show that COVID-19 testing will continue to play an important role even in those who've already been vaccinated. This is even more important now as new variants continue to rise in frequency. Yeah, I think that's going to be very important. You know, like the, as more and more people get vaccinated and guidance comes out saying that we don't need to be tested once we are vaccinated, you know, unless the destination requires it. The ability to track the variants is probably going to get worse and worse because no one's getting tested, right? So how are we going to be able to track these variants? So that is gonna be a difficult thing to tackle. All right, we only have three more minutes in the live stream. Let me just see if there's anything unique uh, in here that we can jump on to. Healthcare orgs aim to expand precision medicine research. I think I have, I've had a lot of people ask about precision medicine in the past. This is probably a good article to read. Healthcare orgs aim to expand precision medicine research. I'm not gonna look into it, but if that person's here, they can check this out. Okay, what with brain implants, the future is gonna be weird. Five virtual physical therapy startups to watch. Uh, millions face long drives to stroke care. Organ collection agencies told to improve performance or face tighter rules. As COVID ravages poorer countries, rich nations bring back to life. I think all of us know like the unfortunate situation that's going on in India right now. Um, Anything else in here? This is the only way to implement AI into the medical practice, but still make sure that it's safe and efficient. I just read a paper about how it might work in the future. Love the type of papers that talk about how AI might be worked in the future. So it looks like this is BMJ Healthcare Informatics in 2021. How machine learning is embedded to support clinical, clinician decision make clin clinician decision making and analysis of FDA approved medical devices. Uh, this seems more just like a use case versus like anything super novel. Anyways, uh, all right, I think that is the main stuff here. I did say that I want to try and take a look at the article. I'm just gonna scan that once to show you guys what that might look like. Let me see. So these are journal articles that come out in Jamia, which is Amia's um, journal. So um, back in the day, I used to read journal articles all the time, but I haven't had as much time lately to do so. Where is the journal article? Oops. Let me pull it up. I think this is it. Nope, this is not it. That is not it either. Uh, here it is. Okay, let me open this. All right, let me just do a scan and we're gonna go ahead and end the live stream. Uh, let's see. Um, editorial, health information technology and clinician burnout. Current understanding, emerging, emerging solutions and future directions. 
So I, I feel like it's I'm beating a dead horse every time I say it. But anyone who's in informatics, I would encourage to read anything about clinician burnout in designing the, these systems because we play a pretty huge role um, in clinician burnout, um, in quality of care, and potentially um, the patients that the clinicians treat. So this is some. Every time I say I'm going to read it, I feel like I, I never get around to it. But this looks like a really good article to check out. Um, I would highly encourage folks to check that out. But we're not going to go into it. Let me open that thing again. Was it this one? Yeah. Let's see what else. Research and application. Impact of problem-oriented view on clinical data retrieval. An interview study with medical scribes on how their work may alleviate clinician burnout through delicated health IT tasks. Uh, empowering physicians with health information technology and empirical investigation in Chinese hospitals. Physicians' electronic inbox work patterns and factors associated with high inbox work duration. Reducing electronic health work record related burnout in providers through a personalized efficiency improvement program. That's a mouthful. Impact of time spent on the electronic health record after work and clerical work on burnout among clinical faculty. This is like one focused on burnout or something. Huh. All right, brief communicate. Retrospective look at the predictions and recommendations from the 2009 AMIA policy meeting. Did we see EHR related clinician burnout coming? Ooh, this looks like a really good one. Definitely check that one out. I don't know, I just think these, these are very interesting articles to look into. I would be curious what they say. Do we have like a thing? Among the findings, the fellows concluded that the degree of clinician burnout and its contributing factors such as increased documentation requirements were significantly underestimated. Conversely, problems related to identity theft and fraud were <laughs> overestimated. That's interesting, That's that, I've never heard of that. Only three of the 15 recommendations were adjudged, more than half addressed. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, they were actually talking about clinician burnout back in 2009 and 2010 with the advent of EHR. So um, this is another article that probably would be fun to read through. All right, let's go back to this. I know we're over time, but this is me nerding out right now. Uh, what else do we got? Measures of electronic health record use in outpatient settings across vendors. Uh, if I had more time. <laughs> Associations of physician burnout with organizational electronic health record support and after hours charting. And this is all on burnout. Electronic health records and clinician burnout story of three eras. Uh, a systematic review of contributing factors of and solutions to electronic... I'm not going to read any more of this. Burden of the digital environment. Measurement of clinical documentation burden among physicians and nurses using electronic health records, a scoping review. Exploring the relationship between electronic health records and provider burnout, a, syst a systematic review. This is all super great. I'm so glad that there's so much literature on clinician burnout. Um, again, hopefully all of us who are in informatics do take the time to read these because it will make us better in terms of um, how we can design these systems. High tech to 21st century cures that clinician burden and evolving health IT policy. I don't remember if I told folks to read this last time. When was this? Oh, this is a little old now, February, 2021. I talked so much about the 21st century cures act. Um, I had the privilege of working with both uh, Dr. Gettinger and Teresa when I was interning there. So <laughs> definitely go check them out. Uh, what else was there? I think we only had a couple more articles left. What else did they have in here? Oh, this is a lot. <laughs> Moving towards a social technical Advancing electronic health record vendor usability maturity, progress and next steps. This would be interesting. Like how, like what, what is the current state of assessing usability? It's actually terrible, by the way, in my opinion. Um, how we assess usability is not super great. So it, this would probably be a fun article to read. Uh, conceptual considerations for using EHR based activity logs to measure clinician burnout and its effects. This is also really cool. 
they were talking, I'm trying to think back. I looked into this in my research before how every HR is mandated to collect audit logs or activity logs. And there were a lot of conceptual frameworks and how we can use that to automatically capture background documentation and use it to enhance our EHRs by making them better. Um, anyways, I thought that was interesting. Electronic consul consultations and clinician burnout, an antidote to our emotional pandemic. Feeling and thinking, can theories of human motivation explain how EHR design impacts clinician burnout? Misdiagnosis, building the evidence base to reduce. Wow, there just is so much burnout. This, is, this must have been a um, clinician burnout focused um, month. Um, maybe in the future, I'll do a live stream and actually go through some of these articles because I was just reading the titles. Usually what I'll do and what I encourage folks to do, take some time to look through the literature. You know, guidelines exist, but primary literature comes out really fast um, and we should be reading them as soon as it as it gets published. This is actually old, November 2020. All right, uh, let me close everything here and we're gonna go wrap up. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining another weekly live stream. Uh, it was probably not as much people today, uh, but that was fun. It was cool. These, again, are kind of like working sessions for me where uh, I'm just learning with everyone live. Uh, and it's a way to not only share the information with the audience, it's also a way to make sure I stay updated with the news, you know, as it pertains to pharmacy, public health, and informatics. But anyways, thanks again, guys, for joining. Um, I'm going to be gone uh, quite a bit in the month of May. So I, I'm not sure how many of these live streams I'm going to be doing. But um, we'll see what happens. But anyways, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. I will see you guys next week. Bye.